Time to discuss Discovery. <sighs> okay, the Trekpocalypse has been postponed for a bit. This wasn't the one with the Guardian coming up, but uh, apparently that one is in the offing. No, this was just going back to Book's home planet. Where, you know, we finally meet the big bad Klingon, or you know, no, Orion crime lord S, I guess. Uh, I think that's something that the the her nephew, or the other guy who didn't, was played by you know the guy who played Ramsey Bolton. I'm not sure about that. Definitely the same type. I have to look into that. But he meets a rather ugly end of the the, the, the business end of another one of them big space worms. But uh, this is why we have sneeze buttons. Okay, but uh, which I don't know where it is. Anyway, and we got to go back and, you know, try and convince the guy in charge of uh, Book's home plan, who happens to be his brother, which, you know, is like a term they apply rather liberally, because, of course, they're a bunch of hippie Jedi, you know, so. And the whole, there's a whole lot of nothing really going on, for the most part, um. Uh, uh, Adira is no longer having one-on-one -on -one conversations with her dead ex-boyfriend. And also, they start introducing the whole thing. And no, no, not she. They, them. It's like, okay. This is the one case where this might actually kind of apply. Because you do have about eight or nine personalities running around inside that head. So, so unless a person has, you know, is, you know... A case of active multiple personalities going on, then they, them, that don't, sorry, doesn't apply. They, them are plural pronouns, okay? You don't get to change the rules of the English language just because you feel uncomfortable, okay? Deal with it. End of rant on that, but they managed to pick up, okay, here's where the burn started, and somewhere in there they managed to pick out an old Starfleet distress signal. Sort of, maybe. They're trying to get a little more detail on it, because, you know, it's just sort of, you know, I don't think they realize how these things work, but, well, yeah, we established that, but meanwhile, back on the planet, you know, and then, uh, uh, yeah, Big Betty shows up, makes some threatening noises, starts carpet bombing the planet, you know, in case they hand over this Andorian for some strange reason, it's like, what is so important about this, you know, Andorian you chop the antenna off of? And a, and a sign, that I'm pretty sure that's the producers realize, hey, the fans still kind of like Detmer. Let's give her more to do. Because Emily Coates can actually act. <laughs> that's another thing. She, they haven't ruined her character completely yet. And so they um, have her take off, and they sort of take Book's ship. Because they can't be firing on it from the Discovery. But yeah, we'll take Book Ship. That was a little plausible liability. Somebody, you know, it's a, like uh, Tilly said, somebody who's acting against orders and will be reprimanded severely when this is all done. Yeah, great. Okay. Whatever. Go with it. You know. And so they have Detmer take. And eventually she, you know, instead of working with the control, comes up a couple of joysticks and goes totally PlayStation on it. And she's having fun. And yeah, again, she she likes the little nickname everyone gave her, Lisa Left Eye. She's having fun with this. You know, she, she's taking it in stride. So they finally restore the Star Trek universe. Bring her along. She's fun. Okay. She can act. She, you know, Detmer's also the only character we can remember the name without having to do a Google search. You know. Why she's wearing armor in this in this environment, I don't know. <laughs> It's like, are you expecting things to blow up? You know. And why is the cat still on the ship? And why not? Why, instead of in, uh, in Burnham's quarters? But. Everybody likes the kitty. What's wrong with Yeah, we gotta have the kitty show up in the most inopportune thing. You have you know, this Andorian who's definitely not a cat person suddenly clinging to the cat for dear life. They're in a battle. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Uh. That also bring you know, briefly touch on the question. If uh, Tilly is first officer, why does she still have a roommate? Shouldn't you have your own quarters by now? The ship is immense. I'm sure they can find a room for her. But. And then have you know, have Michael 
you know, bunk up with uh, Miss D then, you know, they them there, huh? Have the meaningful, powerful conversations, you know, between those two. Well, another thing is also the word. And this is kind of like a uh, second cousin to the kill the gays, you know, trope. It's like, only have the gays interact with the other gays type of thing, you know? Only the binary, you know, thing. You know, it's, it's, the only scene she has is with Stamets and, and Culver. We can't have them mixing with the straights. No, 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 no. No, that would be wrong. We need to, you know... That kind of tells up the one big uh, thing about modern progressivism is it is uh, segregation repackaged. Yes, everyone's diverse, but they're separated with their own group. No, and that is com that is a complete betrayal of Rodbury right there. They like, oh we get, look at all we got we got all these nice and they're they're all kept in their separate little camps. They're all segregated. It's when we go beyond tokenism, and it's like you know we never you know let them go together. Yeah, uh, even you know when you know, we bring in another character like uh, Jet Reno, straight from the set of the Jetsons to you. Yep. I mean Tignataro, openly lesbian, has been for years. So yeah. So yeah, the only other character. You know, the only other person really that, you know, it's only Culber that really gets to talk to anybody else who isn't, you know, part of their little group. I mean, and it's, it's still just, you know, just in the course of being, at, you know, as the doctor talking to uh, Giorgio, wondering why she's melting down. And that's another that makes no sense whatsoever. It's getting weirder and weirder by the moment. And talking to Saru, who is a walking mushroom. So... So yeah, if you, you, you just scratch the surface a bit, it gets a little more more disturbing. The more, you know, but the, the attitude this show is, is displaying towards this supposed diversity, you know, it's not even a salad bowl now, guys. You know, we've gone from melting butt to salad bowl to individual little separated Dixie cups, you know, where never the things will actually get together and combine, you know, to create something greater than the whole, you know. And they're missing, you know, kind of missing the second half of Idic. It's infinite diversity through infinite combinations. Letting them get together and put uh, something together. It's the whole thing. It's, uh, going back to that interview, uh, interview with uh, Sarek on the Inside Star Trek album. And that's, well, you know, you not even go that far. Just take the Idic symbol. You got kind of a circle. And you got a triangle. And where they interact, they create a little jewel. You create something better than, the, than either of the two d separately. They're keeping everybody separate. They're not letting them combine to get this together. I didn't. I didn't plan on going to this profound on this thing, but I was just going to say, yeah, just stupid little stuff. They get together and they have the, and they drive away the little bugs with the power of togetherness and the little hippie Jedi powers, with a little assist from the uh, Discovery sensor array. And everything, oh yeah, we won! It's, you know, you've already been set in the thing. She'll be back and probably with an entire fleet of ships. They're going to turn, you know, they're going to reduce this planet to ashes and hunt you down, you know, skin, you know, mount your hide on the inner cabin wall. But, done, Mary. Yay! Hippie Jedi! Okay. And next week looks like more pew-pew and whatever, you know, so. Who the hell knows? Like I said, if it wasn't for having to redo the reviews, I don't think I, I wouldn't even bother with this show because it's, it's, it's gone beyond stupid and insulting. And, and just... oh, it's insulting. Like I said, I, I would, you know, I recently, you know, I got uh, the Blu ray set for, you know, and series set for Enterprise and was looking at, gotten th into some of the extras in a little chat with Brandon Braga and uh, Rick Berman. And they're being very diplomatic because it is being put up, you know, by CBS Home Video. But without mentioning names, I'm talking about, you know, some of the notes that we get from the net once the CBS had taken over. I mean, Brandon Braggers, it, it, it felt how, just hostile from the get-go, seemed like, you know, they were always going to... Berman kind of clarified, it, the, they went through like three regime changes during the course of Enterprise. And the first two, very supportive. 
no problem. You know, he didn't care about Cluggage. You know, he was head of the network. He would sit in on the pitch meetings and the development stuff of the, of the show from the very beginning. The last regime change, very hostile. And we know what that one was. <laughs> That's when uh, Viet and Viacom, you know, solidified everything, and or CBS bought into Viacom or something or other. And it was put under their jurisdiction, and of course, you got Les Moonves, Star Wars, Star Trek, what's the difference? <clears throat> and wanted to cancel the show, you know, at the third season. And it's only because McCluggage was a you know, big fan and part of the development of the show. You imagine you got that fourth season thing at least ended on a high note. But Bra- but Brandon made the comment of you know how all the note there was a st- the stupidest set of network notes he'd ever seen in his life coming down from there. There was one thing where they t- they were pitching a story they wanted to do for the network, and it was involved a fire on this ship and the guys had to go out and speak and go out on the hull and and do this stuff there and things there and and he's a little nod, head's nodding and again no names mentioned. But Berman mentioned there was a higher up in the fact, probably the, the absolute top of the net, which meant, which, which, which translated to Les Moonves. What's a hull? The, the hull is the outer surface of the, of the ship. It's what the hull. So, yes. It's like, uh, Les, surely, surely you've been in a Navy film or two or a you know, show where you know, they talk about the hull of the ship? It's like, Even even corn kernels have a hull. <laughs> what the hell? And these are people that, you know, and this is the same guy who thought, yeah, we'll do a Star Trek. <laughs> well, hire the guy from that movie. That made a lot of money, right? Yeah, and also divided the fan base right down the middle like a lightsaber. <laughs> and these are the guys now in charge of Star Trek. Please, God. The, the wheel is turning slowly. The, the, the get Paramount back in charge of this thing, but it's going to take a while to take all the tentacles out of spam. One thing about, you know, one thing uh, Alex Kurtzman has learned well from his mentor, JJ, is to stick those tentacles in as much as you can. <laughs> and it's debatable how much he actually does in these shows anyway. Anymore. He just, you know, he's his company's name's got to be on it whether he has anything to do with it or not. You know? It's 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 debatable whether he even gets notes or passed on about lower decks. It's a, but it's a low, it's a secret hideout, you know, production listed in there with the other productions on there. And it's kind of damn for that, but that's another issue. But it's like, he's yeah, I think you had a hand in writing in the first episode of this season. But other than that, it's been Michelle Paradise and her gaggle of morons, which has probably helped minutely in the coherence of the show, but it's still stupid. The signs are still idiotic. And I'm just waiting for the... And if they go with the Guardian of Forever, it's like, yeah, I fully expect to uh, hear the next week about a lawsuit from Harlan Ellison's estate. Because they're going to find out. You, you probably left you know, explicit instructions. If anybody from Star Trek touches this story, sue the living fucking pants off them. In those exact words. <laughs> but, again, for this week, the Trek Apocalypse has been, you know, postponed. It's just another, another hippie Jedi, you know, space locust, which looks kind of like weird jellyfish. Weird. I don't know. It's, it's just... Oh, God. Like I said, I, I only call it Star Trek Discovery in the titles for a matter of clarification, but personally, no, it's not Star Trek. Okay. It never was Star Trek. They screwed up in the first five minutes of the first episode. But. And that's why I don't worry about trying to explain this or jump over the wall. Maybe if they did. No, it's not worth the explanation. It's not worth going down and exerting the mental energy to try and rationalize this crap. You know? The most I would go is like, yeah, if you want to put it in some kind of alternate timeline and option. Yeah, you put the divergence point way back as Archer and Daniels were resolving the temporal Cold War. And as I put it, Archer hitting that big red reset button in the episode. 
where the timeline's re-establishing itself. Well, from there, you had Fracture, too. And off of that, you got, you know, you got the original timeline, which was supposed to be following. But then you got the Kelvin timeline. And then, since we have Vulcan alive, it's a, you know, they, or, you know, it wasn't, they said, let's like a new planet. They said, they, all the indication, this is the original planet and the original location. It looks nothing like the original planet and has two moons now. But it's supposedly it's supposed to be the same damn planet. They stole the name Nivar from uh, Jacqueline uh, Lichtenstein, you know, Lichtenstein, you know, Lichtenstein, Lichtenberg, the Trekanalia, or the Spockanalia fanzine stories. And if I, I don't know if I take that as an compliment that they've, you know, she's now canon within Discovery Universe. And you know, you got you, you basically have you know the the Kurtzman verse stuff, which is you know Picard and and Discovery. So we got three different timelines off of that one at least. Oh, and of course there's a mirror timeline off of the Kurtzman timeline. No, it's not the same mirror universe. Okay. <laughs> we saw how that universe well, actually. It, that universe started off. Uh, we saw that in Enterprise, and these are the void uh, in a mirror darkly. When Zephyr Crockett, instead of extending his hand, extended a shotgun. You know, so we saw that. You know that one going. And even that, you can say the, the divergence was further back than that. Otherwise, you know, never would have pulled out a shotgun. But we get off a tangent. So another, eh, you know, episode from Discovery. And I think, you know, next week, supposedly, I don't know, going more into the twisted mind of, you know, Philippa Georgiou, you know, former empress of the Galactic Empire, or the Terran Empire, or whatever. The hell, I don't care. And we'll see where it goes from there, so. PayPal, Patreon, subscribe, star, like, share, subscribe, yada, yada, yada. I'm losing subscribers somewhere. I think they're starting to, I mean, you know, PewDiePie is getting squished. You know, another, you know, it's like, what the hell of a chance have I got at this point? So, but I'm going to get the lights on as much as I can. So, so I'll catch you later. <laughs>